thank you so much. When I ask these very powerful women, and we're in a very powerful room, to be part of this honorary host committee, not one of them hesitated, um, and I want to, to thank them for that. You all know that we have not made a secret that we are going to be undertaking a $50 million renovation of Newark Symphony Hall. Um, we are going to be starting. We've actually already started. We've hired architects, thanks to support from our Lieutenant Governor. We had a major grant that we received from the New Jersey Historic Trust. Um, but pretty much ha more than half of this room is responsible for accelerating the pace in which that is going. And so I just want to thank all of the elected officials, again, for being behind and our appointed officials, including where our appropriation is coming through from Secretary Way, because it's with only because of you that we're going to be able to do this work. It's going to be creating 500 construction jobs, right? And we're partnering with the building trades in order to train local people so that they can get those jobs, right? Uh, it's going to create opportunities for at least 50 small businesses. And one of them is a Newark business who helped us put together the bid for the architect, a Black-owned Newark business, I'd like to say. Um, and that is Remade Design and Development. Um, I found them by starting out following them on Instagram. Um, and Because <laughs> uh, they did the Tiffany the Budgenista's house. Um, and, and we haven't announced it yet, but I'm trusting that you guys are going to keep it real secret. We are about to be named the location for a national television show called America's Big Deal. It's going to be running on USA Network this fall, starting on October 14th. They're going to be starting to build a stage upstairs. And again, we're putting people to work. More than 100 people are going to be working related to that job, and most of them our Oxy stage hands. And I just want to say the wages for those stage hands for this production start at $48 an hour. So again, that's great. But again, we went to the IOTC and said, we want to get more local people into that union. This city is predominantly Black and Latino, and we want to get more of those people to get those jobs so that they can, it really will change their lives. And finally, finally, because I know I'm way off script and people probably want to pull the, the, the chain. Um, because of all of the production that we've been getting, we started something called a production assistant training program. And this weekend, we're going to be doing our very first boot camp for the PA training program. And the production has already hired Newark people to be on that production. So when you're supporting Symphony Hall, you're not just supporting the great line dancing, you're not just supporting the things that we put on the stage, but you're, put, you're supporting all the work that goes in and the workers that go in behind it. Okay, I'm going to get back on script before I get in trouble. Thank you for indulging me on that. Um, okay, back on script. What is this all about? This is about a partnership that we have forged with Waco Theater Center in California. It's an amazing center that has become, frankly, a center for Black Hollywood in California. And they are partnering with us. It was founded by Ms. Tina Knowles Lawson and Mr. Richard Lawson. And they are partnering with us on an amazing production called Black Terror. Black Terror was a play that was written 50 years ago by one of our very own board members, Richard Wesley, and it launched his career as a professional playwright. We're going to be doing a production that initially when we pitched it, um, and I want to acknowledge the executive director of Waco, Shay Wafer, who did not hesitate when I pitched it. Shay, can you at least stand up? Where are you, Shay? Thank, thank you. <laughs> when I pitched this, it's going to be what Richard Lawson is calling a film, sort of a play and film. And they are going to be, and they also have been mentoring Yentor Theater Company, which is our first contemporary theater company in residence. And why does this matter? This matters not only because we're looking at the future of Newark Symphony Hall, but we're looking at the present, the present of Black art, the, pleasant, uh, the present of centering the people who are in the majority here in terms of our culture. And that is the reason for that. And it also reflects the new direction of Newark Symphony Hall. When you look at our region, we are of the African diaspora. We are of the Latino diaspora, including the... I've learned so much about the Portuguese community in, uh, uh, in this time period. And that's the kind of culture that we're going to be centering here in Newark Symphony Hall. Because centering local people and the local culture, which is international, is the way that we, I believe, will recapture the international name that Newark Symphony Hall 
once had. So we are restoring, we are reigniting, we are imagining this uh, storied institution, and we are doing it in partnership with the people of Newark. But none of this, including this event, would be possible without funding. And so again, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge today's sponsors, because this came about really quickly, just in the past three weeks, believe it or not, when you've got that first message. Um, first of all, it's H&M. Thank you so much. And our representative from H&M is here. United Airlines, which brought out all of Wake Up. Um, and thank you, is United here? Right? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And of course, our present presenting sponsor, Prudential Financial. And at this time, I would like to introduce Shawnee Harris, who is the president of the Prudential Foundation. Good afternoon. I'm Shawnee Harris, president of the Prudential Foundation. Welcome to Newark Symphony Hall's Tea with Miss Tina Knowles Lawson, which I know will be a spectacular afternoon. As you may know, Prudential has been headquartered in Newark for nearly 150 years. This city is our home. And as an anchor institution, we are committed to the continued growth and development of the city and its residents. Prudential values our longtime partnership with Newark Symphony Hall. This institution has also been an anchor for the city in its legacy of elevating the artistry of theater, performance, Black culture, and community. And we're excited for this new chapter for Newark Symphony Hall and its efforts to restore this historic space to its full glory. We commend Newark Symphony Hall's commitment to create opportunities for artists to collaborate and showcase their talent. We look forward to the bi-coastal production celebrating the 50th anniversary of Richard Wellesley's Black Terror by Yinder Theater Company and Waco Theater Center. But today, I am so glad you joined us as we celebrate the career of a true theatrical maven, Miss Tina Knowles Lawson, who has done dynamic work in illuminating talent on stage and screen with a needle and thread. Again, thank you, Prudential Financial. Um, and now here's the real meat of our program. I'd like to introduce our Mayor Raz Baraka. The theme of Tati today is the T, Black Women in Arts Leadership, but it's also a celebration of partnership. It's in my pleasure to introduce another important partner for Newark Symphony Hall, Mayor Raz J. Baraka. Just as we are reigniting this historic institution, he is reigniting, you didn't think I was just gonna stop there. He is reigniting the city of Newark and he is doing it all while still dealing with an ongoing public health crisis. He is reimagining a more inclusive redevelopment where the people of this city benefit and have ownership in its growth. He is also an artist. So he truly understands the importance and impact of the arts on culture, well-being, and the economy. More importantly, he supports the arts and creators, particularly Black and other creators of color. And so I'm so grateful for his leadership and his true commitment to the city of Newark. And now it is my privilege to introduce Linda's husband and the mayor of this resilient and resurgent city, Mayor Raj Baraka. Uh, I, I wanna first thank Tanisha for putting together uh, this, uh, I think, a very incredible program, represent the Renaissance here in our community, in our city, uh, in our state. And, uh, you know, I appreciate it. It looks beautiful in here. Thank you, Talia, you did an awesome job. Uh, and all, all these beautiful pieces, I think, came from Source of Knowledge Bookstore, if I'm correct. Yeah, you wanna shout out, <laughs> you wanna shout them out uh, as well. Uh, aren't we, we, we just excited to have uh, Tina Knowles Lawson and Richard Lawson in our city today, right? Just just want to uh, say thank you uh, uh, for them coming here and being a part of what we're doing. Look, Symphony Hall is worth uh, redeveloping. Uh, it was uh, first 
erected in the 1920s. This is uh, the old Salam Theater, the old mosque theater created by Shriners. Uh, that's why it has some of the finest architecture and acoustics in the nation, uh, because it was designed uh, with that in mind. Uh, there so many people performed here, uh, whether you like the Temptations, the OJs, the Beatles, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones, Leotine Price, Sarah Vaughan, uh, anybody and everybody came there, whether it was salsa or, or jazz, right, or, or comedy like Richard Pryor or, or opera like Leotine Price. So Symphony Hall <laughs> is, is uh, our history here in this city. So it makes sense that this become the one of the finest jewels that we have in the state of New Jersey and on the eastern seaboard. So all the effort uh, that's being put together to make this uh, or turn this back into its fine glory uh, is very much appreciated. And as uh, was pointed out by Tanisha, it will bring all kinds of, uh, you know, activity, wealth, jobs, development in this area, uh, particularly in the south side of Broad Street, which we need uh, so deeply. I should say the south side of Kenneth a Allen Gibson Boulevard, by the way. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it is also fitting uh, that, you know, we have Waco Theater Company here uh, partnering with Yendor, Rodney Gilbert, and the work that Rodney did in this community uh, around theater, that's the clap for Rodney, we're, we're, is incredibly important, uh, along with Richard Wesley. And I don't know if, you know, that kind of connection, if we really understand what that is. I mean, Richard, Richard Wesley, if you haven't seen Uptown Saturday Night or Let's Do It Again, or, or all of those movies like that, you should go check them out, right? Richard Wesley is a Newark-born folk. He's a Newark native, I should say. Uh, and so all of this makes sense together uh, that we're doing this and that we are putting it forward with someone like Tina Knowles Lawson and Richard Lawson at the same time. Whoever thought of this uh, was a genius. It's an incredible, incredible idea. Uh, and I know she's over there taking the credit for it. Did she bow? Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible. Uh, and it's a good start to where I think Symphony Hall will be. So I want to thank all of you for coming out. You look beautiful out there. You look incredible. You're dressed up. You know what I mean? I don't know that guy with that hat on back there, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you you guys look great, and thank you for supporting Symphony Hall, and thank you for supporting the city of Newark. God bless you. Um, at this point, I want to turn this over to one of our uh, sponsors. Um, we, again, could not have brought them out here without the support of one of our sponsors, and that sponsor is uh, United Airlines. And so at this point, I want to introduce the uh, executive um, from United, who is going to have the honor to continue to have our program rolling forward. Thank you. My name is Belinda Pinto. I'm the Director for Corporate and Government Affairs with United Airlines. I cover the Northeast region. It was um, important for United to join Newark Symphony Hall as a partner for the T with, um, with Tina Knowles Lawson. Um, because what we do every day is help unite the world by connecting people to the moments that matter most, right? This, you know, this is our shared purpose. Um, it drives us to be the best airline for our employees, our customers, everyone we serve. Everyone, it's so good to see you. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, wow. First of all, I just want to say that it looks so beautiful in here. I cannot, um, we, we can't, can't say it enough. Um, the entire team and Talia in particular, it's magical in here. And you all just look so beautiful. Um, my name is Blenda Pinto. I'm the Director for Corporate and Government Affairs for United Airlines. Um, a tag team with Monica Slater Stokes, who many of you in this room know, um, is a native Newark, proud native Newarker, and is on vacation this week. <laughs> so, so she's not able to be with us today. Um, but I just want to, you know, again, thank you so much for convening this beautiful gathering and, and this very important conversation. I'm really looking forward to, to it. I have the pleasure of introducing um, the Garden State's favorite Jersey girl and Newark's very own daughter, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. The Lieutenant Governor uh, has been a great friend to United, and I've had the fortune of joining 
you know, my, our uh, sister friend, Monica, in many meetings uh, with the lieutenant governor in Trenton and in her legislative district before that, um, just <laughs> knowing that we were going to visit with her uh, at the time when she was an assembly speaker really felt like, you know, when, when you're going on a, on a school trip or maybe as an adult kind of likened to going on a retreat, right? Um, because it's that, just sort of that reverent feeling um, and, and excitement um, and just really, tru truly, truly in honor. Um, so the, just, just her knowledge, her wisdom, her welcoming vibe all the time. She so freely gives us all. We truly appreciate and are so very proud of the governor. The lieutenant governor was inspired as a young girl to be a fighter for the voiceless when her eyes were open to social injustices and inequities around her, often citing a tale of two cities as her youth awakening. A proud alumna of the Newark public school system, she has since pioneered a successful career in public service, advocating for social justice, women's equality, education, and ultimately becoming the first woman of color to serve in a statewide elected office in New Jersey's history. That deserves an applause. In addition to her role as Lieutenant Governor, she serves as Commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, where she has led efforts to strengthen and expand initiatives for fair and affordable housing, community revitalization, homelessness prevention, local government services that support New Jersey's 565 municipalities. Under her leadership, the department has also expanded and leveraged a wide range of initiatives aimed at assisting distressed municipalities. In her role as acting governor, she has signed multiple bills into law, including those that establish caregiver task forces um, to identify ways to support people taking care of loved ones, the elderly, her accolades and, and efforts are just, you know, tireless. And we, we so, so, so very um, appreciate and are grateful for her leadership and her voice and advocacy for us in Trenton. Her career has spanned the public, nonprofit, and private sectors. She has taught numerous college courses. She has served as a member of both the East Orange Board of Education and the Essex County Board of Chosen Freeholders, was elected to serve the 34th Legislative District in New Jersey in the Assembly in 2003, and a trailblazer in every sense of the word in 2010. As I mentioned earlier, she became the first African-American woman in state history to serve as Assembly Speaker, and that's a huge big deal, a huge big deal. Um, it is truly an honor to introduce one of New Jersey's boldest community champions and to do it in such a historic building that has captured so many moments in the past and still stands to convene us all here today. There's a lot of power in that and it's very fitting. So thank you. With that, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I first want to uh, congratulate Tanisha, the committee that she put together to have this the T, and to the board members of Newark Symphony Hall. And for those of you who don't know, this was last called the Terrace Ballroom. And I recall probably coming to my first formal event right here in this ballroom with a gown and gloves and a corsage, probably my high school years. And uh, there are a lot of historical references, as the mayor pointed out, uh, to this place known as the mosque before it was Symphony Hall. And I'm so pleased that the reason we're gathered here today is to welcome to Newark and to welcome to the state of New Jersey uh, an iconic family that has contributed so much to our culture and to the arts and the work that the Knowles Lawson family does along with their daughters certainly has created 
an elevated sense of pride for all of us. Uh, I want to commemorate the, uh, the music that we heard. The violinist was awesome. And when she, yeah, she was awesome. And when she began to uh, play some of uh, Beyonce Knowles's uh, songs, uh, I had a flashback because one of my favorite CD songs is Off Lemonade and that guitar is in the background and she says she's a Texas Bama <laughs> with hot sauce in her pocketbook. <laughs> and uh, to think of Mrs. Knowles Lawson, you know, they often say apples don't fall far from the tree. And I think aside from being the founder, artistic director of the Waco Theater, one of the things that we can also be proud of uh, Mrs. Knowles Lawson is that she raised two beautiful, soulful daughters. And we all know we have to pour into our daughters. The arts, to me, is the soul of humanity. And having an appreciation for music, for literature, for graphic arts, it does something to the soul. I think that what Symphony Hall is trying to do, and I'm sure what Waco Theater is trying to do, is to bring back to people, particularly people in our community, to focus in on the arts. It sensitizes you to humanity. It enables you to feel. That's what the arts are. They are designed to make you feel. And uh, I just look forward to a pleasant afternoon uh, with all of you and with Mrs. Knowles Lawson. Uh, thank all of you uh, for being here supporting this event. And to Talia Young, I'm so glad you left banking, baby. <laughs> My name is Donna Dozier Gordon, and I'm head of inclusion and diversity for the U.S. for H&M. H&M has a commitment to inclusion and diversity. And as part of that, we are very focused on engaging in and empowering the communities in which we live and work. And so with that, um, supporting an event like the Tea with Ms. Tina Knowles Lawson and Mickey Taylor um, about elevating and amplifying Black women leaders in the arts was, was very important to us. It's very much in keeping with the commitment that we have to inclusion and really um, elevating community. Well, we're going to keep the program moving. I hear our, our guests of honor are getting mic'd up. And so now um, I would like to introduce um, one of our event committee members who um, has definitely made a mark here on the city of Newark with her work in community economic development. And though, you know, I was a little sad that she left one of the organizations that we were partnering with, the Newark Alliance, I'm so proud that she is now the vice president of, Glo of urban innovation. I probably get it wrong. I'm getting it good. Okay. Uh, and that is Aisha Glover, who's going to come up and introduce um, and get really get the program going, but she's also going to make a nice special announcement to you all. So please, Aisha, come over to the podium. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, the work that you're doing, not only to ensure the historic legacy of Symphony Hall, but really to make it relevant to, to the city's economic revitalization um, is just honorable. And not everybody gets that connection um, and the important role that arts plays in economic development. So really just thank you for what you do, but also what you believe. Um, so as she mentioned, many of you know, I had the honor and pri privilege of working alongside Mayor Baraka, helping to lead economic development. I've always appreciated his understanding and leadership around equitable growth. That means leading with residents and small businesses in mind and leading with the arts front and center. Last year, as Tanisha said, I joined Audible uh, to help continue to advance much of the progress that's been made over the past six years under Mayor Baraka's leadership. Audible is proudly headquartered in Newark, 
And as the city's fastest growing employer, we have made amplifying underrepresented voices part of our mission. So we do this by attracting and investing in startups and in the creative community. We are also one of the largest employers and act of actors and creative talent in the entire New York City metropolitan area. That's through our studios when we're able to produce Audible originals. And speaking of creative talent and why I'm telling you all of that, this is not an Audible commercial. Um, speaking of creative talent, one of the incredibly gifted authors we've worked with this year was Mickey Taylor. Her Audible original, Force of Beauty, a Newark family memoir, co-written with filmmaker and director Deborah Riley Draper, is a fantastic love letter to our city. If you haven't listened, you're in luck because we will be gifting all attendees with a link to a free download of this beautiful memoir. Listeners will hear Mickey describe the city and the landmarks that influenced her world from her mother's work with the iconic singer Sarah Vaughn as a hairstylist, makeup artist, and wardrobe stylist, and learn about her role as a salon owner and award-winning stylist. It's a colorful, inspiring story that Mickey recites with grace and detail, vividly recounting stories of music, fashion, history, and straight-up Black excellence. I've known Mickey for years from our work in Newark. We became fast friends as fellow board members for the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and from our collaboration around Newark's first ever Fashion Week event. And another shout out to Talia, since she did all the decor and design for that event. You may know her as the leading authority on inner and outer beauty for women of color. Mickey is a compelling empowerment speaker, emboldening women to own their lives, celebrate their beauty, and master their purpose with distinction. As a former beauty and cover uh, director at Essence Magazine, Taylor casted and produced over 500 covers, as well as its signature beauty pages to affirm and inspire the culture's definition of beauty. Today, she serves as the publication's editor-at-large. As a voting member of the Screen Actors Guild, she continues her commitment to supporting the acting community and influencing the changing representation in film and television. Taylor has worked with some of the world's most fascinating and influential people, including Rosa Parks, Sidney Poitier, Michelle Obama, Rihanna, Beyonce, Oprah Winfrey, and more. She is a force of nature and a force of beauty. Please join me in welcoming the Mickey Taylor. It is an honor to have her fireside chat here at home. I grew up right up the street. This is where we ran down to Symphony Hall in the Terrace Ballroom to be infotained, to see what Black style in all its glory looked like. So I am thrilled to be here today. I am mostly thrilled, though, to have a chat with someone who, by her very contribution, is walking in the dreams of our ancestors and furthering the impact of African Americans having their say in the arts. And it feels so good to be able to say that. She's the embodiment of what happens when vision and determination meet and simply show out. Her career began as a stylist for the superstar women known as Destiny's Child. With vision and tenacity, she went on to brand Beyonce's look for world music tours, television performances and appearances, inspiring millions of what it means to be a Black woman who's fierce enough to be her authentic self. You all better make some unsophisticated noise for that. How about going to work every day doing that? As a designer, she took the fashion industry by storm with such lines as the House of Darion, Darion, and her signature collection, Miss Tina. And as a costumer, added such movies to her credit as Dream Girls, Pink Panther, and Cadillac Records. Today, she's the co-founder and co-artistic artistic director, along with her husband, actor Richard Lawson, who we adore, of the Waco Theater Center in Los Angeles. And she's making a difference in the lives of those in the community by firmly establishing the center as a destination 
where art can occur, where we as a people can create our own narratives and expressions and not only stake a claim, but own the impact. Won't you please welcome the sister who has a seat reserved in my heart, who's blazing a trail for generations to come, Miss Tina Knowles Lobster. The demand for premium content from Black creators has accelerated dramatically as a result of both the rapidly changing media and art landscapes. Yet Black women still struggle with disparities in funding recognition. And I just have to ask for someone like yourself who's traveling this country and who understands this, is this an implicit bias in your opinion? And if so, what? Absolutely. It's an implicit bias. Um, I am blessed enough to have so many young people that I mentor. Um, one of them is Melina Matsuka. She did slim. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, she, she con is constantly telling me about the struggles that they have. And it's, it's mind blowing because what does she have to do to prove herself? Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, she had a major movie and was successful, but still every time she goes for a job, she has to prove herself all over again. And that is one of the, the things that we face all the time. And even with the people that I know, in my circle and, you know, who my kids are, I still, if I'm talking to a network, because I'm about to do a, um, a, a podcast, but it'll be a live visual podcast. But even in that, you and I talked about the challenges that we face because they want to own, they want to own you, basically. And, um, you know, I don't think that that's across the board. I think that is directed, related to that slave master mentality right. that you and I talked about. Right. You know, that I, right. Yeah. right. And, and so, you know, when I think about the souls who want to rob the creativity, first of all, you can, I'm a firm believer that you can only pay me for my labor. You can't pay me for my creativity because that's divine. Exactly. So I'm certainly not going to give you my name. Right. It, it, and yet, so, when I looked at this thing, Tina, study after study has shown that those who hold leadership positions in the arts, from theaters, again, to museums, remain disproportionately white. Mm -hmm. So in the early days of defining Waco, did you find that there was a stereotype of what, say, a theater leader needs to look like? Um, just in talking to other people, because, you know, in L.A., I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of friends in theater and in the arts and in nonprofits and just across the board. It doesn't matter if it's entertainment, if it's business, if it's a nonprofit, we have a harder time. Um, we're not given the monies. With all the programs that we're doing, um, when we started our program with the kids, it was funded by our pockets because we really couldn't get and friends and family. Uh, not, we have a really hard time getting the funds that we need to do whatever we're trying to do. That's the first, because it takes money to do whatever you want to do. But yes, absolutely, I found that we have a much harder time, whether it's fundraising, whether it's the theater, whether it's, you know, whatever we're doing across the board, there is a bigger challenge. And, and the key to that, I must say, is that we have to do it for ourselves. Uh -huh. We yes. really do. Yes, indeed. You know, it's interesting, even in our fundraising, um, probably 90% of the funds that we do get, because we give a big gala every year, we give our sponsors a lot for their money. But even with that, the people that give to our organization are usually the, rep the, the Black person in that company, in that corporation. And I think we should get credit for that because we do give to ourselves. We do support our organization. In addition to funding, what are some additional challenges that our people face in leadership roles in the arts industry? I believe that, you know, it's the age old um, things that we have to overcome all the time. It's the same thing that you are judged by the color of your skin and not your art. We have contributed more to art 
than anyone to creativity, to the fashion, to the styles, to the way people talk. We, we have, we've supplied all of that, yet we get the least amount of credit, the least amount of respect. And it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's mind boggling. And, and I'm so happy that we're finally starting to fight for our rights and to say, no, we have to have ownership. And we're not going to allow you to just continuously take and take that don't you want to give. Yeah, I think I, I'm amazed that it's still a challenge to create um, racial and cultural equity in the performing arts of all places. Yes. When I think about even this sacred house where performers like Sarah Vaughan and Aretha Franklin and the list goes on and on performed. And the, if you look out at the audience, and I remember the audience as well, are you saying that it's enough for us to entertain you, but not for us to invest in you? Exactly. Absolutely. I, I just... Um, well, I, I just, so what I know for sure, after years and years of talking to and for and about us, is that an investment in Black storytelling is also an investment in the culture. And you and women like Tanisha Lind, and I just have to say, for Tanisha to be the sole African-American woman heading up an arts institution in the state of New Jersey. Yes. And, I, and as you said, we have to do it for ourselves. And so what I'm saying to those of us in this room is that we have no chance at the win if we don't support her. Yes. Because in 2021, it's time for us to stop being first and only. Yes. I mean, this is the future that we dreamed of. And if the lessons of the past haven't grown us to know that we must do this for ourselves, then we miss the class. Mm -hmm. So I say to us, as we're gathered here, that what Ms. Tina is doing, what Brother Lawson is doing, they need more of us to come to the table. And I got to tell you, I am thankful, I am grateful, and I bow to our mayor because he's got an open ear for the critical work that must be done. And I don't take that for granted. I don't take that for granted. I hop more planes, at least before COVID, than the pilots. And <laughs> so I know the difference. Yes. But, but to come back to this thing, you and Tanisha are only the power of us. And you're amplifying and being champion, champions for underrepresented storytellers. You're providing economic development opportunities. That is important, as well as catapulting us to be at the decision-making table. And I know that if we're not in the room, the decisions by and large won't impact us in a way that we are deserving of. I, you know, I think about Misty Copeland. When she is done with dance, will she be the leader of a ballet company if we don't do something? What, what's the future for Amanda Gorman when she's 35? Where will she sit? We got to think about those things and anticipate. So in the meanwhile, the question is, what else can we ourselves do to reinforce change in the art? I think the biggest thing um, is to support. And that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about Tanisha, who is sacrificing a lot, because I'm sure she could go many, many places where the struggle wouldn't be as real. But she chose this struggle. And in order to do that, we have to support her 100%. And we do. Um, and support each other, because what I do find um, is that sometimes we're divided. We are programmed for them to separate and divide us so that there's always criticism that's, that sometimes it's okay to criticize. And, and you know, the new thing is um, 
no one is above reproach. <laughs> and no one is above criticism. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very true. But when we are in a position and we're trying to do our best and we're spinning our wheels and working hard and sacrificing, and then someone finds something wrong with what you're doing and they start tearing you down, tearing you down, it's just been, I mean, that has been what's kept us down is the division. We are way stronger together. That sounds like an aside, but it's the truth. We got to support each other. And we don't need to air every little criticism because it's hard being out front. You know, I found that, you know, in a situation, and, and I'll use my my um, family as an example, it's, it's like you try to do something and you try to help, and then someone has something to say about it. And the latest thing that we've dealt with, um, you know, my daughter did a, a campaign and she insisted that $2 million be put into black colleges, which she does all the time. She supports them. And I read a comment where someone said, I don't know about that $2 million. I think they ought to give it back. And I'm like, that's easy for you to say, but that college student that is depending on that to go to school, like, what kind of sense does that make? And I'm not saying that there should not be any criticism, but do your research and don't be so quick to criticize because usually the people that are the loudest critics are the ones that's not doing a darn thing. That's right. It's just true. That's right. So we need to support one another and... And that's really important. And also, you know, about the storytelling, what I find is even with the kids that we mentor, one of the programs that we do that's the most effective is we tell them that you've got to go back and interview the oldest person in your family. Ah. The matriarch, the patriarch, your aunt that's still living. Find out about your ancestry. Because a lot of times you came from some royalty and you don't even know it. So, you know, that's a part of it. So all of us have a story to tell. Uh, we were with some people and one night and everybody started telling the story of their background about their grandma and, you know, what the traditions were. And I was like, right here is four television series. Right. Uh, I mean, because it, it is so interesting. So all of you have an interesting story. Go back, look at your ancestry, you know, do your DNA test and find out because everybody has a story to tell. And, and, and the more stories we tell, the better we feel about ourselves and our background. Because we, we are not what they yeah. project us to be. We're that's way right. more. Say it. We got to say a story. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, it's interesting that you say that. I was in Louisiana back in July. Uh, working on a project. And while I was there, I went to a land blessing. And it was so stirring to see black women and men standing on the land where their ancestors were slaves. Yes. And to hear each of them tell their stories and to not only name their family tree, but their contribution. That's right. And so you're right. You have to know your narrative. Yes. And that is the content that we need to see. To see. Now, everybody's not going to invest in that, but we need to invest in it ourselves. Yes. Absolutely. And, and I've got to ask you, what else can and should be done to provide Black creators with ownership, creative freedom, and support in the arts? I think educating ourselves on what our, um, you know, what our objective is and what are the laws. I mean, we, one of the things that Richard teaches is for people to create what they don't see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a young man that I mentor and uh, I'm so proud to say that we just got a show uh, that we're working on right now, and it'll be coming soon on OWN, but it's also on the Discovery Channel. Yes. And how it came about was he came to me very, very discouraged during the time of the R. Kelly documentary and the Michael Jackson. It was almost like he felt like there was an attack on, not that those stories didn't need to be told, 
But it was, he was like, I need to look at something positive about black mm -hmm. men right now, and I can't find anything. So I said, create it. You know what y'all got for my husband? If you don't see it, create it. So we need to create our own stories, our own narratives. We need to educate our, ourselves on what our rights are and don't give your, your, your stuff away to someone for the opportunity because there will be another opportunity. You know, um, we, this, the, the premise of the story is to debunk the myths about black men, like black men are dangerous. Um, how many times black men have walked by a car and the people lock the door, they hold on to their purses. Uh, black men are sensitive. They don't treasure their women. So we are trying to debunk those, um, those myths. And, um, and he would never have thought that just that talk would lead to him starting this show. And, and you know, I say all the time that the, the own is great and I'm excited about it. But what I'm most excited about is the Discovery Channel because we already know we're not dangerous. But I think the rest of the world needs to see it. And I'm just kind of rambling. But my point in that is that if you don't try, you will never, you know, you'll never accomplish anything. And he would never have thought that he could get this on TV his first time trying to do a project. So, and I educated him on, no, you just don't jump at the first chance you get. Let's shop it. Mm -hmm. Let's get everybody bidding on it. Let's you know, let's know our rights and what we can own and, and, and the whole thing. So I think a big part of it is just exposure and finding someone who can explain to you and not jumping at the first thing you see. I love that mentorship. And that, that's what I know to be so true about you. And every time I'm in the room with you, I feel like I'm in a master class oh. because you were so clear about us and knowing who we are and what we deserve. And, uh, and most folks don't want us to know that. Yes. You know? I love the good news. And speaking of good news, uh, there are opportunities for Black women and men in leadership roles, and many more are there for the season. What gives you hope when you think about that? Well, I think that we made a lot of strides and I, um, you know, I choose to concentrate and to, to look at the things that make me hopeful. Mm -hmm. You know, we have made a lot of progress. We got a long way to go, but I feel like there is hope because finally I feel like the world had to stop and pay attention. Um, and they had to see all of the disparities and all of the, the pain that's being caused. And are we there yet? No, we got a long way to go. But I do feel hopeful. And I feel hopeful in the arts because art changes lives, guys. You know, a lot of times I hear people saying, well, I got bigger fish to fry than worrying about the arts. But the arts, when kids are young, Trust me, it changes lives. It's the way we express ourselves. It's the way we expose terrible things that's going on in the world. So it's, it's multifaceted and it, it really is important that we support it. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be encouraged to dream without that's right. Us. That's right. And to see ourselves in those dreams, uh, it's, it's, it's critically important. And so I'm going to ask, selfishly ask one more question. I'm so glad no one held up a time card for me because I really think <laughs> those things. And I get so disrespectful because I turn the other way. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, they promised that we would take questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask one more and I'm going to honor that they're going to take questions from the audience. <laughs> With Waco, you and Brother Lawson are changing the paradigm for future leaders who look like us. Now you're playing a major role in the revitalization of Symphony Hall, which opened its doors in 1925. That's big. That's big. And Tanisha, please stand up. Yes. Yeah. Stand up, Dolly. I need to put the view and the cameras on you. I want you all to know that this is what leadership, I didn't say leadership, 
This is what leadership looks like. It looks like Tanisha. It looks like Tina knows Lawson. It looks like Brother Lawson. When you make a leadership, you change the paradigm. And so this really calls for us to make a leadership. I really do believe that change is now, that the trail has been blazed for us, and it is on us to show up ready. So I want you, Miss Tina, to tell us your thoughts about this Black girl magic that you and Tanisha are creating, what's entailed, and why this Newark partnership is so important to you. Well, this, when I heard about it, um, Shay Wafer, who's our director, told us about this, this project. And of course, I've, I've heard about the um, Symphony Hall. And to tour it, I'm telling you, when I walked through here, I could just imagine, um, and I'm getting emotional about it, because one of the young ladies, Ebony, said, I have a photo of my parents dancing in this place. And I can just imagine us in our finest clothes, just dancing and having a place that we could be proud of and holding events and, you know, teas and, and, and just exposing um, our young people to, to things that they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. Um, I think that this is such a great opportunity to, this place is beautiful, first of all, and, and you can feel the spirits of, of Billie Holiday and, and Sarah Vaughn and all the people that were here. And I think that is such an opportunity for us to create something that we can be so, so proud of, the renovations of this place. And I just applaud uh, Tanisha because she just has this big, huge vision. And, um, you know, she reminds me of my husband because he's always like <laughs> light years away from everybody else with his vision. And I, I, I just feel it. I feel like it can happen and we just have to support. We have to do whatever we can. I'm committed to getting the word out. I've already started to try to bring people in and uh, and we need to just get this done. Yeah, that's right. That, that's the that's just the 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 magic that um that it's gonna take. You know, it's gonna take a, a group effort and it's something that all of you can you know, be proud of to tell your kids in the past on generation to generation. I love that. I love that. What I love of the many things that I love about you is that in the work that you're doing, you know, some people like their names on signage and bricks and marbles and all of that. You are setting legacy. You and Brother Lawton, you and Brother Lawson, are setting legacy, and you're putting names on the hearts and minds of our young. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. I want to thank you for being here with me at home. I want to thank you in advance for the work that you're doing that I can't wait to go downtown again, as we used to say. I used to hop the 13 bus and come down here. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I know some of y'all were around then. I wasn't the only one. But to come here to this place, thank you all for coming our way, for sharing, for coming to stay and to make a difference here. You all serve it up for Miss Tina Knowles Lawson. <laughs> You all serve it up, yeah. Do, do. You all serve it up for Brother Lawson. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. This is what hope and change looks like. What an amazing discussion with Miss Tina Knows Lawson. Thank you. As you know, Newark Symphony Hall plays a critical role in driving economic growth and community development. They are helping to build the local economy, enhancing the surrounding businesses, and providing job opportunities and ways for individuals to participate in the arts. 
We believe a vibrant arts and cultural district attracts and retains residents, businesses, and visitors. These districts facilitate engagement and community collaboration, encourage foot traffic, and catalyzes development such as live work housing for people in the creative sector. As a longtime partner, Prudential is excited about the next chapter of revitalization for Newark Symphony Hall. With the board's vision and Tanisha Nass Laird's leadership, Symphony Hall is well on its way back to its place as a premier performance venue and a Newark community asset while stabilizing and adding to the vibrancy of the Lincoln Park neighborhood. Thank you again for being here today and thank you for your support of Newark Symphony Hall.